I was telling Sister Donna this morning, uh, of course she knows most of this, but uh, I've been pastoring since 2004 and I have uh, all of the notes of all of the messages that I've done uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and some revivals since 2004. Uh, I know there are some preachers that, uh, especially evangelists that do revivals that have a set of, of a five or seven sermons and they can do those same sermons over and over. Uh, God has not blessed me with that ability. Uh, I, maybe in those years since 2004, I've repeated a sermon maybe maybe four or five times. It, it just doesn't work for me. I always seem to have to, to do something different, something new, even though I have all the notes. And so when it comes to something like communion, uh, think of a, a way of doing uh, something new, something different uh, when you're trying to teach the same thing. And uh, this week, as I was thinking about the Lord's Supper and, and to teach on the Lord's Supper and the message to bring, and I was thinking about how Paul talked about when we come to the Lord's table, how we inspect ourselves. And, and, and he tells us that we're not to take the, the communion, we're not to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And I was thinking about, well, how do you, how do, you do that in a worthy manner? And so I was, as I was thinking of that, I was thinking of people in the Bible, people that I've known that have served God, that have worshiped God. And, and one that came to mind this week as I was thinking about this service uh, was Mary Magdalene, um, not one of the 12, not one of the men, not one that was seated at the table. Um, we've kind of questioned sometimes, maybe I have, I don't know if you have, but questioned where were the women when we had the Lord's Supper? Uh, certainly there were women that were part of following Jesus. Mary, one of those. Uh, we know some things about Mary, some things we've kind of come up with conjecture. We're not 100% sure that she was the one for some of those things, but where would Mary have been? Where would Jesus' mother have been during that Lord's Supper? And so as I was, I was thinking about that and, and thinking about Mary Magdalene and thinking about how she was the one that the Mary that went to the tomb uh, early on that first morning. And you think about what would have been in her mind, um, what Jesus had done for her, uh, the scriptures teach us that she was the Mary that, that had the demons. Um, it, it, about uh, probably 17th century, they, they began to teach. The church fathers uh, figured out that she was the one that he cast the seven demons out of. And, and some of the things about Mary that we learn. But the, the one thing we do know is Mary went to that tomb. And you can imagine for those three days, uh, the Jesus... The, the master, the savior, all that he had done for her, all that she had put her hopes and trust in like the men. Uh, and now it seemed like it was all over. Uh, as far as they knew, even with his teachings and their misunderstandings, he was dead. And so everything they had put their hopes in, everything they put their, their faith in, their trust in, their future in uh, was lying in that tomb. And the scriptures teach us that, that early on that Sunday morning, that first day of the week, she went to that tomb. And when she got there, uh, and John tells us this here in John chapter number 20, um, there was nobody there. She thought they had stolen him. He had said he would rise again. He used the, the illustration, you tear down the tabernacle and, and I'll raise it up in three days. He had told them what was going to happen, but still she her hopes were dead. Her faith was dead at that point uh, because of all that she had been through. You can imagine the three days of, of grieving and worrying and the emotions. And when she looked in, she, all she saw was the cloth. He was gone and she saw the angel sitting there. And again, John tells us all of this. But as I was thinking of that and thinking of as we come to the table and Paul says that we're to inspect ourselves and we're to make sure that we're worthy, um, we don't believe that the, the cracker, the wafer, the unleavened bread, we don't believe like some teach that that actually turns into the body of Christ. We, there's nothing in the Bible that says that, so we don't teach that. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing magical about the juice. So to those that are watching by way of, of internet, or you know, if you're not able to be in the service where we're having the communion, uh, we use the unleavened bread. We use the grape juice. That's what Jesus did. That's what the Passover meal was. It, it's not so much the, 
the items you use, I think. I remember one time I preached a message and, and I talked about the elements uh, of the, the Passover meal and I was corrected on that, that the Catholics use the term elements because those are the ones that do the changing. You don't use the word element. I, I was corrected on that and so I took that correction with grace. Jesus tells us, the, the Bible tells us, history tells us the Passover meal was the unleavened bread. It's not, and, and like I said, I don't think it's the point of what we use as much as it is the reason behind it. The, the time that we look into our hearts. It, it, and I think God did it kind of like, you know, you're supposed to go to your doctor and get a checkup. You're supposed to go to the dentist twice a year and get your teeth checked out. And that keeps you from having problems. And so Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do it as a checkup, a spiritual checkup to examine yourself. Is everything right between me and God? And I know that we do that. We're supposed to do that daily. Uh, you, you know, we pray and we ask God to forgive us of our many sins. And sometimes we do that so much it kind of becomes habit. And so this is a time when Jesus says to really get serious about it. That's why it's a very solemn service, a very sacred service, a very important service. And so we look at somebody like Mary and to find out how do we compare, but not that we're to compare with somebody else, but how, how do we make sure that we're obeying Paul's instructions in, in 1 Corinthians that we're worthy of coming to the table, that we're worthy of partaking in that last supper. And, and, and as I started it off by saying what Jesus did with those men, whether the women were there or not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it was very common. It, it, it was practice. If, if you read the history of the Jewish people uh, in the Seder meal, the Passover meal, that the women had important roles to prepare. The children had important roles in how the, the service, the, the, the family meal was conducted and the things the children uh, had lessons built into it. God put all of that in there in Jewish tradition. So whether the women were there or not, we don't know. When Da Vinci made his painting, there's some that argue that there's one uh, at, at the side of Jesus that could have been Mary Magdalene. We don't know. It doesn't, that person didn't have a beard. You can't really tell if it's male or female. Whether the women are there, the Bible doesn't say. Some teach they were not. Uh, there are some that teach the Jewish tradition are uh, <clears throat> that the, the men would get with the rabbi. <clears throat> and, and this is, I borrowed this from my wife on the way down here this morning. I began to question. I said, have you ever thought about where were the women at the Last Supper? And she said, I just watched a, a, a lesson on that yesterday and uh, was talking about the Jewish teach that the women would not have been in that particular part of the meal because the men would get together with the rabbi and discuss spiritual matters and ask spiritual questions and the women weren't there the night before. Uh, the Catholic teach that the women would not have been there because this is where Jesus, it, they say that this is a, a setter meal different than any other setter meal because Jesus was instituting the church. And I can find validity in that. Uh, Jesus was instituting the church. That's, you go straight from the gospels into the acts of the apostles and that was the birth of the church. Uh, the very next thing that happens in the Bible timeline, after the crucifixion, the resurrection, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the birth of the church. And so the leadership of the church being vested uh, in the, the male, um, uh, men being the, the pastorate and, and in the Catholic denomination, the, the priesthood, uh, I, can, I can see that too. So whether they were there or not, I don't know. Um, but I do know Mary Magdalene had such a relationship, such a worship with Jesus that even if he was a dead Jesus, she still was looking to worship him. She still had all of her hope, all of her faith, all of her trust vested in him. And so she was where she last saw him at that tomb. And she was going to do the last thing she could was to help embalm and the way they embalmed back then to anoint with spices, over a hundred pounds of spices, his dead body. And so John tells us about that. And so as we prepare our hearts for the communion this morning, I want us to do it thinking about Mary, some lessons that we can learn from Mary and some lessons we can apply to our life uh, as we approach this spiritual checkup. Uh, somebody that loved him so much that even if 
he was gone, even if he was dead, uh, she was willing to beg his body back to do one last act of service for him. You've heard it said, you know, God never did another thing for me. He's blessed me so much, you know, that I, I would still serve him. And that was exactly the life she was living. So if, as you stand, as you turn to John chapter number 20, we'll begin at verse number 10. And Jesus had taught them. Jesus had taught those men and Mary in his hearing. Uh, chapter 20 of John begins with Mary coming to the tomb early. Uh, Mary tells the men that he's gone. J uh, Peter and John come. Uh, they look in. Uh, they see that he's gone. They, and, and we've talked about this in some messages previously that John just wasn't sure. He didn't have all the facts. Peter thought, well, if he, even if he is alive, what I've done, he can, you know, it's over for me because he had denied him. And so Peter and John went back to town. But according to what John says here in, in John's narrative, Mary lingered behind. Um, heartbroken, grief stricken, um, all hope gone. And in those tears, she leans over and she looks in the tomb one more time. Now remember, she's already looked and seen the cloth there and he's gone. And, and John picks up her account here in, in verse number 10 and John writes this down for our benefit and God's inspiration for us to learn from. And in John chapter 20, verse number 10, then the disciples, Peter and, and John, returned to the place that they were staying. They, they had run from the city out to the tomb. They looked in, they saw he wasn't there. You remember that account? He's not there, so why linger? They go back to town, but Mary stays. She lingers at that tomb before, it, it's probably sun up now on this Sunday morning. And verse number 11 says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Now picture that. And as she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, she's already looked and seen he was gone. And verse 12 says that she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. Now, imagine if you're Mary and you see an angel. John describes this, that it's an angel. He doesn't say she saw something that she couldn't recognize. She saw, if you would have seen an angel, what would you do? And the angel said to her in verse number 13, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. She still thinks they've stolen the body. And having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Same thing the angels had said. Who is it that you're seeking? And supposing he was the gardener, she said, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. In verse 16, John says, Jesus, she still doesn't know who he is. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now that's all she said. These next words are the words of Jesus because of what she does. When he said Mary, immediately, the scales were lifted from her eyes and she realized this is not the gardener. It's you. It's Jesus. And she falls to her feet and she wraps her arms around his ankles. And I can just picture her throwing her face on his feet and wetting his feet with her tears. In verse number 17, Jesus tells her, don't cling to me since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers, those two that just left and hightailed it back to town. 
the ones you just went and told he's gone, go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've just seen Jesus. And I tell you, he's alive. Father, we thank you for John. We thank you for your inspiration to put this story into the Holy Writ that on August 29th, 2021, in Hampton, Kentucky, we get a picture of a woman that you had saved and she loved you so much that she was willing to give everything to serve you even if you never did another thing for her. Father, I pray that in these next few moments that we in this room would be able to see Jesus and just as she was commissioned to go and tell Peter and John and the others, he's alive. We would answer that commission. But in answering that commission, that during this service, we would look at ourselves. Not that we're going to be compared with anyone else when we stand before you, but that we would compare ourselves to this woman a woman that had been demonic possessed and yet loved you so much she was willing to surrender everything even if you never did another thing for her. May we inspect our lives today in such a way that if there's anything untoward in us, if there's any sin in us, that we would confess that, repent of that, turn from that, ask your forgiveness. And remember what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As I said, we don't know a great deal about Mary. She's listed several times in the scriptures. There are several Marys, so you've got to kind of cipher through which Mary is which. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. There was Mary Magdalene. There was Mary, which is the mother of Jesus, but is identified as the mother of James and Joseph. There was Mary of Bethany. It was a very common name. But as we see this Mary Magdalene, John is very clear here on which Mary this was. As I said earlier, the church fathers by the 17th century thought that this Mary Magdalene was a reformed prostitute. We're not real sure. There's no real evidence on that. The, the church fathers just put together some extra biblical stuff and probably some tradition passed down. This was still 1,700 years after the crucifixion that they came up with these ideas and began to put it in the commentaries and the extra biblical literature. And the church kind of adopted that, that this is who this Mary was. Some of you have talked to me recently about the, the series that's out right now called The Chosen talking about Christ is a new television show that's out and it, it's getting rave reviews. And one of the first of those is a, is a story of Mary Magdalene and how she's as a child possessed by this demon. And, and in this story, which it's, it's not a hundred percent Bible, they've taken some literary license with it, but they show how the rabbis come in and the teachers, the Jewish leaders, and the Roman guards are asking them to do something with this woman and the Roman or the, the Jewish leaders come in and even there because of how possessed she is, they're kind of taken aback by her until she meets Jesus. And Jesus just speaks the word and she's delivered of all of these demons. And then the church fathers tells us that this is the same Mary, whether or not she was a reformed prostitute, whether, you know, all of these things we, we say about her and, and, and maybe mixing up with the other Marys, but we believe she's the Mary 
uh, th there at the last when Jesus had gone into one of the homes for a supper that she comes in with this box of expensive perfume. You remember that box that she takes the perfume and she breaks the box, breaks the seal and she begins to anoint his feet and wipe his feet with her hair and Judas gets all upset. You know, we could have spent that money to feed the poor and of course we know what Judas really wanted to do with that money and, and again, whether or not this is the Mary, we, we're not 100% sure. There are some things according to the Bible that we do know about Mary. We, we know that Mary Magdalene, because of her name, just like Jesus of Nazareth, uh, we know where she was born, where she's from, that area uh, just west of the Sea of Galilee. We, we know some of her history, the family that she would have come from because of that. We do know, uh, according to Luke, that she is the one that Jesus delivered those demons out of. Uh, that was, you know, one of the miracles that Jesus performed when we talk about Jesus healing and raising people from the dead and Jesus delivering people of demons. Mary was one of the first that had this, this possession and Jesus delivered her of that. When we read about Mary, all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, apparently were impressed with her enough that all four of them put her in their gospels with things that, that she has done. So, as the disciples, the apostles, especially these four writers of the gospels are, are telling their accounts, Mary was present in much of those scenarios because they, they talk about her throughout their gospels. They, they relate to this Mary Magdalene. Again, whether she was a reformed prostitute, where she, how she got the money or where it came from to buy this expensive perfume or whether she had spent all she had to get it and, and, and that we do know she, as I said, she is the the one that and Mark talks about that in Mark 15 and, and, and she's there with, with the, the mother of the Mary, of Mary the mother of, of Jesus. And, and at the end, she's one of those along with his mother and Salome that purchases the spices that we read about here in John chapter 10 where, or John chapter 20 where she goes to, to anoint or to embalm the body. She, she does have those spices and those would have been, again, expensive spices. So... You know, that tells us some things about her. But I think the most important thing of all we can learn about Mary is what John tells us here in chapter 20 because that tells us something of her character. When Peter and John came, when she said they've stolen him, they've taken him away and they run to the tomb and they look in and they see he's not there and for whatever reason they run back to the, they, they, they race back to town and we get that picture of Mary alone, according to what we see there, lingering at the tomb because she had loved him so much. He had done so much for her. He had given her hope when the world had cast her. I mean, if she was a reformed prostitute, even a woman in that culture, all hope was gone. And yet she lingered at the tomb. And John tells the story. Perhaps he gets it from her. Perhaps Jesus tells him over the next 40 days. She's just standing there and she's crying. She looks in and she sees the angels and she's upset with the angels thinking they've taken the body away. And then she turned around. I can just hear Jesus probably telling Peter and John, probably telling Thomas, she turned around. She didn't know who I was. She thought I was the gardener. And Jesus would probably have a laugh about that a few days later. But then she would tell the story. I think it impressed her so much when he called me by name. He knew my name. There was no doubt who he was. And I fell at his feet. And he told me not to cling to him, that he had not yet been glorified. He hadn't, he hadn't yet ascended, but he was going to ascend. And she tells that story. That, that's the picture we see of that Mary right here. That, that Mary that we can learn from having been demonic possessed, the need of being forgiven. I mean... If anybody needs forgiven, somebody that has possession of demons needs forgiven, right? And, and yet we can learn from her our need of forgiveness. And he provided that in what he did on the cross and here at the tomb and, 
then his ascension back to the Father to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and so we can learn as we come to the table where Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, he says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood. If you take the cup, you take the wafer in an unworthy manner. We use the terms in church, closed communion, close communion, open communion. Some churches have closed communion. You've got to be a, a member of that church because they, they feel it's their responsibility. And I'm not saying right or wrong. They feel it's their responsibility to make sure that whoever participates in this sacred service of the communion is a born again baptized believer. And so you've got to have your name on their books to make sure they know that. You, you can't just come in and, and maybe take the risk of doing that unworthy. Well, like I said, I'm not going to find fault with them for doing that. I see where they get that, but the scripture says you're responsible for that, not church leadership. And so there's those that practice open communion. Anybody can come in. And then what we do here is what we call close communion. We, we ask that you just be a member of a, of a Bible believing church that you are by your testimony, born again and baptized. And then if you, by your testimony are a member of a church, you don't have to be a member of this church because it's not our responsibility to see that you're ready, but you do have to be a born again, baptized believer and of the age of accountability. That's why we don't let children, it, 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 you know, I, and I've heard parents say, you know, I have difficulty when my children are there. They, they want to participate. And I understand that, you know, something's passed out and a child sees that. And I want to do that too. And that's where parents use that as a teaching opportunity. We wait until we're old enough to understand the, the value. We understand the meaning, the significance. This is not just any cup. This is not just any wafer. This is not just any, any juice. It, it's what it represents. And again, it's not magical. It doesn't turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. But what we remember on this day is what Mary was acknowledging here, our need of forgiveness and what he has done for us. And because of that, our, our thankfulness that he has forgiven us. And so it's a time when, because we've been forgiven, we come to the table. But then Paul says that you don't come to the table unworthy. You can't come with, you shouldn't come with sin in your heart. This is a time to pray that prayer. God, search me. Let the, the spotlight of heaven look in on me. And if there's any, anything in me that's wrong, I ask that you would forgive me. The, the psalmist in Psalms 119, he talks about that we should learn to, to hate the things that are against God's commands. He uses very strong language, God through the psalmist, that we should turn away from that, repent from that. That's, that's that forgiveness. And so the need of being forgiven. And so Paul says, examine yourselves. Now that's not always an easy task. Sometimes there's little sins that we like to hang on to and little things that we do, little addictions and little things that, oh, well, nobody will know. And Paul's telling the church in Corinth, you need to inspect yourself. And if there's anything in there that the Holy Spirit convicts you of, you need to ask for God's forgiveness and then repent, turn away from that. Don't make that commitment to God. God, I'm giving this to you. I'm asking for forgiveness. The Hebrew writer talked about the sin that doth so easily beset us. Sins that entangle us. It, I mean, God was honest in the scripture. It's, sin is easy. The devil makes it that way. It's easier not to do the things of God. It's easy not to get up and come to church. It's easy to get into the habit of not being in the house of God. It's easy to get out of the habit of reading the Bible. It's easy to let prayer slip and slide till it's no longer a part of your life. It's, it's easy to do the things of the world. The devil just makes it that way. And so God says, this is a time to do a, an inventory, a personal inspection. And when we're aware, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, then we ask for forgiveness. And we look at Mary's life, demonic possessed. What a need of forgiveness. And when she found that, she was grateful. She was thankful. And so she replaced that desire for sin. If she was a reformed prostitute, we don't really know for sure. But, <clears throat> but after 
After Jesus delivered her of those demons, she, she had a fiery passion to serve him. I mean, you find that in her anointing his feet, which was a symbol of anointing him for burial, not even realizing what she was doing. And then after he's dead, her willingness to anoint his dead body. And then when she realizes it's him in the garden, just to fall to her feet, her, her knees and, 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 and wrap her arms around his ankles and, and, and just to want to hold on to him. That need that she had, that passion that she had. She understood repentance. She understood forgiveness for what he had done to her. And then Mary had a great faith. And that's evident in what she's doing here the first day of the week while it's still dark. We see there in verse number 10, she makes her way to that tomb. That's, that's a great faith. And, 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 and then to, to go and to tell Peter and John, I think they've stolen his body. He's not there doing something what she can to, to take care, to, 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 to make things right again. <clears throat> and then when she looks in that tomb and she sees the cloth, strips of cloth lying there, she sees those angels there and she still didn't understand. And we want to be quick to, to you know, kind of judge. Well, he had already taught them. They should have known. But, I mean, we've got the history of hindsight. You can imagine. You can imagine putting yourself in her position and looking in and the body's gone. And then you go and you tell the men that you assume would do something and they come and look and they turn around and run back. What do you do? And then you look in and see the angels and you don't even recognize an angel when you see an angel and you, you say, if you've stolen the body, just tell me where you've taken it. And then you sent somebody behind you and you turn around and you see who you think is the gardener. And, and again, you, she should have recognized Jesus if she was that close to him. But remember the men walking to Emmaus? Remember all that journey? Several hours of a walk and they were telling the whole story and he was like, oh yeah, Really? And they never realized it was him. Whether God cloaked their eyes, whether he looked different in the resurrection, or you know, we don't know. We do know that just like those men, when he sat down with them at Emmaus and he began to break the bread and the scales fell from their eyes and they said, oh, it's him. So Mary, when he spoke her name, the faith that she had the faith that she fell down and would worship even if he was dead. That faith that we need, we can learn from somebody like Mary. And we can learn how easy it is to lack faith. Again, the, the hindsight we have, but her, <coughs> with all of his teachings, still her and the disciples, the women and the disciples, they all thought it was all over. So it, it's easy to understand how doubt can, can creep in. But even in that, she was seeking him. She was looking for him. If you've taken him away, tell me where you've taken him. Now, what was she going to do? Uh, you know, she's not a great big woman from everything we read in about their culture and everything. And if she would have found the body, how would she, you know, tell me where you've taken him and I'll take him back. How would she have done that? But she was just so seeking him. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. Whatever it takes to find him, whatever it takes to get him back, whatever it takes to make it right. If we would just learn to seek like Mary saw early in the morning while it was still dark and she thinks he's dead and she's still seeking through three days of grief. You can imagine how emotionally spent she is, how swollen her eyes would be from the tears and how discouraged she is that when she tells the men he's gone and they come and then they leave and you can imagine all that she's going through and yet she's still seeking. We can learn from Mary's seeking. And then we can learn from Mary to hear his voice. He knows your name too. And when you're at your lowest, 
when you're going through difficult times, when it seems like the rest of the world just didn't get in it, didn't helping and pushing back. And, you know, sometimes you just feel all alone. That's how she felt. And in that moment, in that time in her life, of all of the things he could have said or scolded or corrected, he used her name. You know, children learn their name. Parents teach children. There's something about that name. We talk about the importance of names. And Jesus, just in the simple act of saying Mary, and when she heard his voice, she recognized his voice. She acknowledged his voice. When we hear the voice of God, when we're seeking him, before we come to the table, Paul says, don't do it in an unworthy manner. Our prayer should be, God, help me in all the chaos of the world, and man, we live in a world of chaos, don't we? War, rumors of war, earthquakes, hurricanes. There's so much going on to call for our attention. In the middle of a worldwide pandemic, people suffering all around us. I told somebody this week I was getting, and, and I, I don't say don't, but I, I was getting so many calls and texts and requests. And I told somebody, I'm just weary with all of this. It's just overwhelming. And I'm not saying that to say don't because I, I want to know and I want to be able to pray. But in all of that chaos, in all of the world and the rush and the bustle, to be able to hear his voice and that our prayer would be, God, let me recognize your voice in the middle of all of it. You remember the account when, <clears throat> was it Elijah, <clears throat> was looking for God and all that he was going through and God told him to go out on the mountain. And you remember there's a rushing wind that came by and the kings, the first king says, but God wasn't in the rushing wind. And, and then there was a, another storm that came through and the lightning and all of that. And, and, and then the scripture says, but God wasn't in that. And he goes through all these scenarios of all these things and these, these loud, obnoxious things that calls for our attention. And all of those loud things. And then the scripture says, but God wasn't in that. And God wasn't in that. And God wasn't in that. And then it says, and then there was a still, small voice. And God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? I think it's kind of what Jesus was saying. Mary, what are you doing here? You know, Jesus had said, who do you seek? What are you looking for? Why are you here? In the middle of all the chaos and the clamor of life, just to be able to hear God say your name and then to ask you, what are you here for? What can I do for you? What do you need? to be able to hear his voice, to recognize his voice. That's what this is all about. That's what communion is all about. That's what the table is all about. And we don't use the table now so much with COVID. We use the little individual sanitized and, and these have all been sanitized before they're given to you. Amelia's made sure they're all wiped down and nobody touches them and they're handed out. And, and Jesus would just say, when you come to the table, be still, be quiet, listen to me, listen to my voice. And then when we hear that voice, what we learn from Mary is she rejoiced. When he said, Mary, you remember she had turned and she saw him and she said, if you've taken him away and, and then apparently she's turned away again because it says then when he says, Mary, she turns and then she falls at his feet and she rejoices because she says, and, and that word, the, the Hebrew, the Aramic, it says Aramic, but, but that word more than a title, that title was a reverence, a worshipful, a rejoicing. She didn't just say Jesus. 
She said, Rabboni, which is master, teacher. In that one word, she's acknowledging, you're the Messiah. You're the one. You're the one our forefathers told us about. You're the one God said would come that, that they talked about would occupy the throne of David. You're the one that that star said was going to be in Bethlehem. All of that was tied up in that word, Rabboni. She was acknowledging, you're the son of God. She was rejoicing in who he was, what he was, what he had done for her. As we come to the table, as we participate, God, what you've done for me, you've forgiven me, you saved me from hell. You saved me from hell on earth. You've reserved a place in heaven. You're building me a mansion. You've given me access to the throne room. You've given me an audience with the creator of the universe. And so when I peel the top off of that little juice cup, it's more than just peeling the top off of a little juice cup. It's acknowledging Jesus' blood that was shed on that cross. It's acknowledging that body that went to that garden and said, could you not just wait with me one hour? That man that said, Father, is there any other way? Could you just let this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And then took the beating on his back for our healing. And so all of these names that are on our prayer list and on the wall and on our text, and they're more than just names. God knows each one individually. And when I go to God, I have direct access to the throne room. And because of the stripes he took on his back, I can say, God, would you heal? God, would you touch? God, would you let the, the comfort of the spirit bring peace in the midst of the storms? It's all in there. The blood, the body. Again, nothing magical. Nothing magical. But oh, it's glorious what he did. And he did it for me, Danny. He did it for you, Daryl, Patty, Bob, Teresa. He did it for you, Eric and Ashley. I could call you all by name. You can call yourself by name. He did it for you. And so he says, as oft as you do this, Sister Donna, if you'll go ahead and come up. As oft as you do it, you can do it every day. You can go to temple every day. Jesus says, I don't care. You can do it every Saturday, your seventh day Adventist. You can do it every Sunday. If you go to a church that does it every week. You can do it every fifth Sunday if you go to North Livingston. However often you do it, remember what I've done for you. Remember what Mary was experiencing, what Mary had been through. Remember Mary, demonic possessed, sinner, saved by grace, and so full of worship, so full of compassion, and so full of love. If you never do another thing for me, my, how you've blessed me. Thank you for my salvation. Now, Is there anything in me? Is there any habit? Is there any sin? Is there any pleasure that I'm holding on to? Is there anything you've been talking to me about and I'm holding on to it thinking nobody knows but me? Maybe it's a doubt. Maybe I just don't know who you are. Maybe I just don't, just don't trust you. I've been hurt so much. 
God, would you take that? Would you fix it? Would you mend it? Would you put it back together? God, I'm surrendering it all. Whatever it is the Holy Spirit's saying to you, you just pray and you ask him, just like Mary had done many times. God, here's my life. I'm laying it on the altar because of what you did, because of who you are. I'm asking that you slay every Goliath of unbelief that's in me. Like Paul told the Corinthians in the second letter, take every thought captive. Because in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of the rumor of war, in the middle of hurricane, in the middle of earthquake, in the middle of flood, in the middle of the storm, God, I don't want to just be a hearer. I want to be a doer of your word. You notice what God did to Mary, what Jesus did to Mary? Right after she acknowledged who he was, he, he commissioned her just like he commissioned those apostles. Go and tell them. Go and tell them I'm alive. Go and tell them I'm going, tell them I'm going back to the Father. Your Father. I'm going back to my God. Your God. Jesus said, my Father is your Father. My God is your God. Think about that. The God of Jesus is your God. The Father of Jesus is your Father. And he says, remember that when you come to the table. When you take the juice, when you take the wine, when you take the bread, when you take the wafer, remember the price that was paid for you. You inspect yourself and you pray as I lead us. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day. We thank you for people like Mary whose life is an open book. It'd be so easy to judge her because of her doubts. We wouldn't want somebody judging us because of our doubts. So, God, we want to look at her life. We want to we be more not so much like Mary, but more like Jesus because of what Jesus did for us. We're about to symbolically come to the table. We're about to participate in this communion, this Lord's Supper, this Last Supper, this Seder. So God, look inside me. Holy Spirit, look inside me with the searchlight of heaven. And God, if there's anything in me Thoughts, attitudes, if I've hurt somebody, if I've offended somebody, if I've been quick with the tongue, if I've been judgmental, if I've held on to that little secret sin because nobody would know and I realize you know. God, as we all ask that for ourselves, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, shine that light in our lives, in our soul, in our spirit. There's just something about that name. Master, 
Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Stand up. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Just you to him one more time. Jesus, 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 there's just something about your name. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about your Turning back to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter number 22, everybody has their cup. You may be seated. Luke tells his account, it says, when the hour had came, Jesus reclined at the table. We got that picture of that low table and they would have had pillows, not like our dining room tables. They would have reclined around the table. The apostles were with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That's a very loaded sentence. <coughs> The Jesus that was about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and say, Father, if there is any other way. And yet that Jesus that was fully divine, God on earth, that spoke in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter number three when the devil had stolen us away and God had come into the garden and just like with Mary, why are you here? Just like with Elijah, what are you doing here? With Adam, where are you and what are you doing? God has a way of knowing the answer before he asks the question. And that God that said, I will send a redeemer, that you won't have to die, that spiritual death. You will die the physical death. That's going to happen. There's consequences for sin. You'll have to leave the garden. And to make sure that you do, I'll put the cherub there with the flaming swords and you won't be allowed back in and you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. And boy, if you've been in hay fields in the last three days, you've sweated by your brow. 
this humidity in Kentucky. It's a reminder of that perfect 72 degrees in the Garden of Eden and a reminder that sin cost us a lot. That God that said, I'll send the Messiah, that God in Jesus reclined at that table says, I have fervently desired for 4,000 years to make this right. This is it. What's about to happen is going to pay all that penalty. This is the sacrifice. This is the substitution. And this is it. So don't forget what I'm about to do. Lock it in your heart. Don't forget. Every time you do it, you remember my desire was to pay this price for you. Physically, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. I fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again. I'm only going to do this one time. There's not going to be no more bulls and blood of goats and sheep and doves. That's not going to happen anymore. Tabernacle sacrifice, temple sacrifice, this is going to finish it. This is the payment. I'll not eat this cup again. I'll not go this way again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. And then he took the cup. There were four cups on that table. They all shared from the cups. And that last cup is the one that we're going to partake of. That's the last cup. That's the, in, in the setter meal, that's the cup of Elijah, the prophet. That's the cup that he's coming again. That's the cup you're looking forward to. He took that cup. And after giving thanks, he said, take it and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's coming again. And he was saying, remember that. I'm coming again. Just like I'm going to die right here, I'm going to come again. And then he took the bread. They had a loaf of unleavened bread. You, you wonder where the women were. The women, had, I think, had baked that bread. I don't think men, men could cook bread. I think the women had to cook the bread. But everything was prearranged when he sent the disciples to make this room ready. And he gave thanks for the bread and he broke off of that loaf and he passed it around and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I, I said while well, ago, I got ahead of myself. This is the cup of Elijah. He took that last cup, verse 20 of Luke 22. And then he took this, the cup, the, the last cup after supper and this is the cup, this cup. This cup is the new covenant. You had the old sacrificial system. This is the new one. This is where I pay the price. This is the new covenant in my blood. It's going to be poured out for you. So if you'll take the side with the wafer, peel back, the covering on the wafer and take your wafer out. Verse 19 of Luke 22, Jesus said, when he took that bread, he broke the bread and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body which is given for you. And remember when you do this, <clears throat> this is a spiritual checkup. We've already prayed that prayer. We've already asked God. We've already inspected ourselves. Paul says you don't want to come to the table unworthy because this is a big deal, what he did. Eric, would you give thanks over the bread? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
And they took the bread and they ate it. And then as you peel the cover off of your juice, fruit of the vine, Luke chapter 22, and verse number 20 says, in the same way, like he did the first cup, he took this last cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Father, we thank you again for this Lord's day, this first day of the week. We thank you for the gift of Christ coming to this earth for our redemption, the blood that he poured out once and for all the sacrifice made. God, as we give you thanks for what Christ did and as, as we do this, we do it in remembrance. God, we again ask for forgiveness where we failed you. God, we drink this cup in remembrance looking forward to that glad reunion day. In Jesus' name, amen. And they took the cup and they drank it. And then the scripture tells us they sang a song and they went out into the night. Now remember, as they went out into the night, they went through the Kidron Valley, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane he was going to his crucifixion. Some of them were going to their suicide. One was. One was going to a denial. They had good intentions. But Mary, whether she was there or not, when Mary fell at his feet and he said, don't cling to me. And the very next thing he did was he commissioned her. He said, go and tell. He gave her a job. And she did it. The last thing he did before he went back to heaven after the resurrection, just before the ascension, he called all the guys together and they went up on the mountainside. And he commissioned them. He said, now go and teach and baptize. Win the world at your job. Win the world. Win them with a smile. Win them with a pat on the back. Don't win them with road rage. Don't win them with forgetting who you are. Don't win them with forgetting who you belong to. So I thought as we went out today, we would sing this song, If You'll Stand, as we go out. May this be our commissioning song. I have decided to follow Jesus, and there's no turning back. Aren't you glad he didn't turn back? He could have said, no, I don't think so. I'm going back to heaven, and you fend for yourself. But he decided to follow through. May we decide to follow through. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, though none go with me. 
I'll still follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And may that be our commitment song, our commitment prayer. May it be stuck in our head this week. I have decided to follow Jesus. Brother Bob, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?